And uh, Colossians is a great book. Uh, interestingly, in my some 50 years of preaching, uh, I preach very seldom on Colossians. And a couple of years ago, I spent the first four months of the year studying one book. And over and over and over and over again. And uh, driving the word into my heart and into my thoughts. The big Bible that you guys have seen, I told you the Bible, if I turned around the last row, the church could read it. I got one of those, I don't know what pipe that is, but it's it's huge. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I've written all over that thing. You know, I got notes on the side and notes in the middle and, and uh, you name it. And uh, uh, I've always told people, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's sacrilegious to write in your Bible. Well, you need to see my Bible. So <laughs> my, mine are just uh, written all over the place. And some of them are colored in. Some of them that I studied uh, have different kinds of things. But I just want you to know a lot of times... Uh, I have my mom's Bible and every once in a while I'll open it up and I'll see what passage was precious to her uh, what uh, notes she took on some subject <coughs> and so uh, you know you never know uh, uh, your Bible I know my son's claiming the first Bible I have uh, Keith for the mission and uh, it was one I carried for 20 years. And so you know it's got a lot of stuff. I couldn't tell you what side of the page things were on. I had it so long, you know. I've gone through a lot of Bibles since that time. And uh, when I bought that back in the 60s, it was an exorbitant price. I think I paid $85 for that Bible. Uh, it was, uh, the name of it was Dixon. It was a King James. But... Uh, uh, had a lot of helps, a lot of notes in the back, uh, uh, you know, kind of an accordance, a dictionary, and all sorts of things for, for helps. And like I said, I carried that Bible just for years and years. Uh, I, I knew that Romans 12, 1 and 2 were on the right hand top of the page. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it's a wonderful thing. I think, to make the Bible yours. Yes. Make it yours. Yeah. And I love to see people who write in their Bibles, who make a note here or there. Uh, some of you have sub-notes now. You have studies underneath. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's a note in there that you, you know, I have underlined some yeah. of them and said, boy, that's a good thought. That's a good thought. And so... Uh, just a, just a little lesson on how I use my Bibles. Good to see you back there, folks. Uh, we've had some that uh, had some operations and some things, and we're glad to see them back. Praise God. Amen. And so anyway, uh, uh, this is the Wednesday night service from Midway Baptist Church, uh, midway between Athens and uh, uh, as you're heading towards Athens, or as you head towards Madison, about midway. And so, uh, good name for it. There probably aren't a lot of Midway Baptists. I don't know, maybe there are. And so, uh, I know there's a whole lot of First Baptists. <laughs> right. And I always figure when I see a Second Baptist that uh, that was a disgruntled group from First Baptists. <laughs> And you guys may not believe Huntsville has a third Baptist. So, I, I, you know, I can just dream of what happened there. <laughs> and so, as we study tonight, uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this wonderful book that you allowed uh, Paul to write in prison and uh, give him time to put his thoughts down that could be carried now literally many, many times around the world. And uh, in those days, it was going specifically to uh, a city of Colossae and Lystra, uh, maybe a hundred miles or so away from uh, Ephesus. Lord, we thank you 
that uh, you have kept the word safe for us yes. from Genesis to Revelation. And we know that as they continue to find things, uh, whether it be in caves or wherever they are, it continues to substantiate the word of God. Yes. And uh, Lord, we thank you for that. And we know it's a book that uh, wasn't written by one man. We know it's a book that uh, was written by some 40 different authors and uh, in several languages. And yet, Lord, we know that from beginning to end, there's a crimson cord through it. We know that uh, it holds the truths from beginning to end. And we believe only you could have guided those some 40 ones that laid uh, pen to paper or to parchment or to whatever it was they wrote on. And uh, that uh, we believe that uh, you kept them from error. Uh, yet you allowed their personalities to show through in their writings, uh, their vocabulary, their thoughts, as you gave them uh, your incorruptible word. And we're thankful, Lord, also that, uh, Father, that you sent your son to come to be the one who is our Savior, our Lord. And we pray tonight we'll extol him and lift him and we'll give thanks for this church that preaches the gospel and everything that's done from Sunday school to children's works to the ministry of our pastor. Lord, bless us and uh, may those who listen to this on YouTube be blessed and we pray that some may even be saved and that many might grow. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, tonight as we look, uh, I want you to realize that uh, uh, I picked up, like I said, the wrong set of papers. We'll let the folks know out there. And so our folks here always have a, kind of an outline that they can write on, but they've had several. So we're going to look a little bit at, uh, at last week's and then get into 16 this week. We looked at the rule of peace last week, and we realized that real peace can only come from God. Amen? Amen. Real peace comes from God. Because we in our own hearts are not at peace with ourselves or at peace with our world. You know, I always got a kick when it says, you know, this country was going to war with that country. I didn't know countries had reason or thought processes. No, it's people. It's people, right? And uh, with hearts that uh, are not where they belong with God. And for all kinds of reasons. Uh, we've had ones that wanted to rule the world, from Napoleon to Hitler and to uh, some sitting there uh, in countries today would like to rule the world. And so I'm glad I have the Prince of Peace who rules in my heart. Yes. Amen. And so we looked at peace last week. The peace that passes understanding. The peace of God. That's peace he gives you. Not only did we get the peace from God for our own hearts and lives, but we have peace with God. Uh, we were enemies to him. And he made us one. He gave us a way to come in. He gave us salvation. He gave us redemption. He gave us sanctification. And thank God that the one who died as his record uh, Friday and uh, rose again. The demons had a party when he died. Now, I don't know what Lucifer was thinking uh, or Satan to most of us or the devil, but... Uh, I guess he wondered all through Christ's ministry, is this really the Christ? Is this really that second one of the Trinity? Is this really him? Uh, did he really come? And uh, I know he tested him over and over again, tried to have him killed over and over again. But as you think about it, 
uh, I guess they finally figured out and figured he was the son of God. And I think they just had a great time hooping and hollering that the devil had gotten his way. He said, I will reign, I will rule. But he found a few days later that old song, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph <clears throat> over his foes. And he did meet that guy that was on the cross, by the way, in paradise. Not heaven, paradise. Met him. As he did with all <clears throat> those that we read about in Hebrews 11. Yes. Uh, and many others that aren't in Hebrews 11. All the righteous of all the Old Testament went to paradise. Now, we know that for us who have that peace of God and have Christ in our hearts and lives, that when we die, it says what? Absent from the body and what? Present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. Present with the Lord. We're not going to go to paradise. We are going to go to where Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit rule and reign. Amen. And so we have peace. And I think we also have a greater peace because we have the Holy Spirit who seals us, who, who teaches us, who guides us, who's uh, the third person of the Trinity. And he doesn't live somewhere in outer space. But he lives in me. Amen. He lives in me. Yes. And he lives in every believer around the world. That was the promise of Jesus. He said, if, I'm, if I go away, I, I will send you a comforter. That comforter is with all of us. <clears throat> and so we have peace. What a wonderful thing. And uh, that, the rule of peace goes to the reign of peace. And that reign of peace will ultimately be that we will live and rule and reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years plus. A thousand years plus. Now, when you say, why do you say that, Pastor? Well, we know that we'll reign with him throughout the millennium because that's the promise. Yes. My friends, there's a great big eternity after that. And the only reason there's a thousand year period that we mention at all is because those who have died outside of Christ through every <coughs> different epoch of time, through every different period of time, from Adam and Eve, the Tower of Babel, and we take history right through the Old Testament, New Testament, and into today, everyone who has not believed in Jesus Christ has gone to that place of torment. Yes. That the rich man went and last <clears throat> went into the bosom of Abraham. He went into the bosom of Abraham. And so, uh, and that course was paradise. But there was a place all that time, because paradise today, by the way, is in heaven. It is in heaven. And so the only place left there that there's an inhabitants at all is the place of torment, mm -hmm. where the rich man said, can, can, can Lazarus just come and give me a little drop of water in my tongue? Or could he go back and tell my five brothers? <laughs> no, they probably didn't listen any better than he did. And we know that there was one who rose from the grave that people still don't listen to. In fact, more people don't listen to him than do. There are billions. My friend, you hear what I said? There are billions in our world today that don't believe in Jesus. And the number is growing in America at a rapid rate. It's awful. But you and I know that the reign of peace, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign himself. 
and uh, he will reign from Jerusalem. But ultimately, there's going to be a new Jerusalem, a revamping of heaven and earth, and uh, there will be eternity. I don't know that that incorporates. I know that the speed of sound is about 186,000 miles per second. Yeah, that's 186,000 miles per second. Now that's putting right along. Some, some of you have heavy foots, but not that heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and you just think about that, that maybe when we have our new bodies, that the speed of light won't even mean anything. Yeah. You know, like, you know, how, how many years it takes for a rocket to get to Mars or Venus or somewhere else. And what are they going? They're not going 186,000 miles a second. But they're going about 17 or 18,000 miles, you know, an hour. Uh, and that's nothing to spit at either. That's fast. Yet it takes years and years and years. I forget, I knew one time, uh, the nearest star to us, how, how many light years it was away? Whoa! It's just amazing. Amazing how big our Milky Way is. And it's only one, one of a bunch of them. Well, my Savior is going to rule and reign forever and ever. Yes. With all of us who loved Him. Yes. I'm thankful, though, that He first loved me. You first love me. You know, I think this is just a natural. I think it's a natural. That we find the rule of peace through Jesus Christ and the peace we get from God, the reign of peace that we will be part of. And then finally, what does it happen? Well, I think Thanksgiving should be in our minds. When you know the Lord and you have his peace and you have his satisfaction, there ought to be a thankful heart. Amen. I am so sick and tired of seeing people who are Christians that are grouches. <laughs> <laughs> really? Right? Amen. I, I hope you're sick and tired of it too. Yes. That, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I just can't believe that you know when you know Jesus there's not a, a, a step that you have that's lighter than someone else's that there's a peace that you have there's a satisfaction that you have and that you can have a thankful heart you know I know that we live in a world that's not very thankful I believe Christians do their best to be thankful Maybe they're the most thankful people there are in Christians. But I also know that uh, I can't remember of the number. We'll use just a thousand. Uh, years and years ago, I read of during the war, this radio guy uh, found jobs for people. Uh, he did a job search and he put it out on the air and you know, hundreds, uh, if I remember right, got jobs. You know how many thanks he got? Just about none. Well, that's like Jesus with the ten lepers. Didn't all ten of them run right back and thank him? You better shake your head. <laughs> Not up and down. <laughs> One came back. Remember Jesus said, were there not ten? And I think in our world today, it's maybe one in a hundred. Our children today aren't taught to thank people when they get a gift. My wife gets so perturbed to see that, you know, you give gifts and people don't know how to say thanks anymore. <clears throat> people don't know how to say thanks. Well, I hope you're not one of them. Because as a Christian, I believe we ought to be thankful. Do you? I think we ought to be thankful. And so last week we looked at that. And this week, uh, 
we, we looked at uh, verse 316 of Colossians 316 uh, this is a great verse it says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching admonishing one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord I think that's interesting it says you know let the word of Christ uh, dwell in us the word of Christ as we as we look and see that uh, we have our title tonight the acceptance of the gospel and then I have a subtitle that we're going to use in every one of our titles under that the gospel of Christ and its our first one the gospel of Christ and its entrance into our lives and its entrance into our lives you notice that uh, uh, what is the gospel of course uh, uh, the Greeks considered uh, the word the gospel good news it, good news well I want you to know my friends it is good news it is good news <laughs> it's saving news it's news that makes you whole it's news that makes you fit it's news that prepares you for heaven it's the gospel the good news and here we see that it says in 16 let the word of Christ and of course whose word is it I really believe that God the Father Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit were the ones that guided all the writing of the word and I believe it shows you what uh, the Lord thinks about the word. And notice whose word it is in the old King James. Now I know in some of the others there's different translations. And in some translation, yours might say, now let the word of God dwell in you richly. Well, I don't have a lot of problem with that because uh, God covers three people. Now, a lot of the time, I believe in the Old Testament when it's God, it's the Father. The Father. The Father. Who, who was doing... Uh, we know in Ephesians, it was the Father who planned the church. It was the Son who purchased the church. In that very first book uh, of Ephesians. And then, finally, we have, it's the Holy Spirit that possesses the church father's plan Christ's purchase and the spirit his possession and that's it he comes into our lives possesses it yet we can shut him out of our lives he's there and you can use him or not use him you're a fool and I'm going to tell you that plainly if he's in your life and you don't use him that's right you're a fool Bible says don't call people fools when I'm telling you you are a fool if you don't allow the spirit to use you you find when he uses you you find joy you find peace you find satisfaction now does he always put you in just great positions where the sun's always shining and it never rains and you never have a storm in your life there are some Christians that say, you know, you're either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're going into a storm. <laughs> and so, but no matter where you are in that process, is Jesus with you? The whole Godhead in sense is with us, but a special person of the Godhead is with us till the day of redemption. So, and I believe that's when I go home to be with the Lord. When I go home to be with the Lord. The gospel of Christ, it's entered into our lives. Faith comes by hearing and what? Hearing by the word of God. Someone had to tell us. 
Didn't they? Someone had to tell you. No, I, I know I went to church when I was in diapers. My parents took me to church most every Sunday. And I know I heard the word sometimes and raised my hand. But guys, I know that the day my grandmother knelt with me in front of her cup, that a transaction took place in a 10-year-old boy that changed his life forever. Yes. Yes. Yeah, changed to the life forever. <clears throat> Grandparents have a big part, you can in the lives of those around you. And besides, they go home when they're done. <laughs> now, some of us, we stayed stay longer. I, I know that. But there's times they'll just wear you out. I was talking to a friend of mine from Buffalo uh, yesterday, and he said that uh, uh, his, he had his twin grandsons for a couple hours and he said, man, he said, they wore me out. <laughs> they wore me out. Well, Christ and the gospel, uh, the gospel has entrance into our life. Uh, someone tells us the gospel. I always loved the four spiritual laws. That, uh, uh, and I liked how they started. I know that the old Roman road starts out and kind of points a finger at you and says, you're a sinner. Well, yeah, we are. We are. I always liked that Campus Crusade approach where they came out with the four spiritual laws. And the first thing it says, and God loves you. What was the old saying? You get more flies with honey than vinegar? I always love the approach and God loves you and then the next step but you're a sinner and you're separated from him and he would love to have you come to know him would you like to say a prayer and ask Jesus into your heart I used to love those four spirits of God I thought that was a great approach but the gospel of Christ it has an entrance. My friends, if you can't remember the time you were saved, I'd be afraid. Now, I don't do that to scare any of you. Since, oh, I was too young. I don't care how young you were. You received Jesus. It, it ought to be memorable. Now, can I tell you what day of the week it was when I was a kid at 10? Uh, I, I, I know it was summer vacation because uh, I found it out it was a summer day out of my grandma's house down the porch and uh, went outside and uh, you know played and did what I what I what I wanted to do but uh, uh, no I don't know the day now it was a lot of you who were older it's like a lot of them at the mission they come to know Jesus while they're there <coughs> They will tell you, well, you know, on April the 12th, it was probably uh, 10 o'clock or 11 in uh, one of the classes where I heard the gospel and I've seen Jesus. Or it was Sunday morning at the Mission Chapel and the preacher was preaching and at the end of it, I raised my hand and I said the sinner's prayer. And I went and told the person on duty, I asked Jesus into my heart. I asked Jesus into my heart. I always love when guys come to me and they say to me, you know, I'd be dead. If it wasn't for the mission, I'd be dead if it wasn't for the mission. It's a great thing to be part of a rescue. 
You know, your church is part of Rasputin's. You guys, as you <coughs> preach the gospel, you're part of Rasputin. As you guys support not only here in the people of Athens and the things you do and missionaries around the world, you got to support the rescue mission. And all of you that give cans and pray and give finances that go to the mission from this church, you know the souls that are saved at the mission you're part of? When you stand before the Lord at the Bema seat, listen to me, when you stand before the Lord at the Bema seat, you may find there's a whole bunch more people there than you ever knew that your life had part of because you gave. Because you gave. You gave money into the offering plate that went to the mission. You gave. You went down and gave a special gift at the mission. You know any of those when you support a missionary. And he leads people to the Lord. You've had part of that mission offering. All the souls saved. You got a little part of it. Amen. I believe that. That's what yes. I was saying to Pam when her and I were doing these for weeks and weeks all by ourselves. Uh, uh, now Jim was smart enough. He could do it on his own. I, I'm not. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I said to her, you know, if anyone receives the Lord or grows close to the Lord, Pam, that's part of your reward. Amen. Yeah, our videography there that uh, uh, she came special to record and to get that so that it could be out on YouTube. You and I will never know during this pandemic how many people more may have been saved than if we hadn't had the pandemic. Now, I know it was an awful thing, and I'm not rooting for pandemic. I'm going, yay, pandemic, yay, pandemic. Uh, <laughs> you know, but I am saying that often under pressure and under bad circumstances, more people are saved than under good. Paul led a lot of people to the Lord after he was saved. But when he was Saul of Tarsus, he was getting people saved then too. He just didn't know it. Because when he would run them out of one town and they went to the other town, guess what they did in the other town? They witnessed of Jesus. Yes. They witnessed of Jesus just like Paul did when he was saved. They put him in prison and the prison guard gets saved. And the guy in the in the, in the the lock up with him gets saved and the one next to him gets saved. I met a guy that I felt was probably the nearest like Paul than anyone I have ever met. And uh, he, he was uh, around, came from around the India area, India, not, not Indians here, but India. Um, I can't remember if it was Pakistan or what country it was. And uh, he got saved. <laughs> well, I, I think I remember he said, you know, he was in the infantry, uh, actually a, on a horse uh, in, in an army, and uh, when he got saved, he started telling others he got thrown in jail. This guy, you know, was five foot nothing, dark skinned, and or witness. He said, well, you know, while I was there, he said, I led the fella in the cell with me and the fella across from me, the fellas on either side of me, the prison guard. <laughs> he said, so they moved me to another part of the prison. He said, the guy in my room in the cell, he gets aimed. <laughs> guy next to us would get saved and the guy on the other side, a guy across the way would get saved. He said, I think they finally kicked me out of there, he said, because they soon would have been all Christians and they'd have had to build bigger jails because you weren't supposed to be Christians. You know, 
as a as a young minister to hear that testimony yeah. and a young minister to be uh, I, I just thought uh, it's it's like the story I have of Shane Nelson who was our, our, on the Buffalo Bills and he was part of what uh, was called in football days back when Jim Kelly was there at, at Buffalo uh, the, the you have three UG uh, that are linebackers in a lot of plays and one of those linebackers uh, calls all the plays you, you didn't know the defense had plays as well as offense yeah you did they call out when they see a certain formation they call out a formation and every once in a while, they call the wrong one out, and the guy gets a touchdown. He said, how'd that guy get loose, so loose? <laughs> well, they, had, they, they probably had the wrong set of plays for what was up before them. And uh, nobody knew who to take that man. And so that's what Shane Nelson did. He, he set the play for the defense. And, uh, you know, he said, when the chaplain led me to the Lord, he said, I had to learn a new language. Yeah. He said, because when I used to tell him, he said, I used to tell him what to do. And he said, you know, Jim shaking his head, you know, he was a sailor. Most of the ones I know that were sailors were pretty good at this too. Of uh, language that uh, we normally don't hear in church. In the church. Yeah. Well, we'll just put it that way, okay? And, and uh, he said, as God dealt with my heart, and I grew in the word and in the things of Christ, he said, I literally had to learn English all over again. You know, a lot of our guys at the mission, when that they come to know Jesus, uh, you know, that to me, guys that get saved at the mission are one inch from hell. They won't go into church. They will come to a church to get a handout, but they won't come to hear a preacher preach. And if you hand them a track, if you go to the end of the driveway, they've thrown it away. Just think. And I, and I always picture, you know, that you have the church lined up in front of a great chasm. And there's a lot of holes in between it. There's a church here, and then 15 miles away, there's a church. And people are coming towards the precipice. The precipice is hell. And they're just flooding towards it. What did Jesus say? Broad is the way. Well, these big gaps between churches. And then you had that layer of missions and those type of things that sit almost on the back door of the precipice. And I always felt that when somebody could get by us and not receive Jesus, they were this far from hell. When we get people saved at the mission, I really believe they're inches from hell. Inches. See, that's our business. The gospel, as it enters our lives, changes us. Yes. Changes us. We next have the enthronement, the gospel of Christ and its enthronement in our lives. In 16, we read, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, that's the entrance into our lives. And... Uh, in all wisdom and teaching. The enthronement is we, we find, as it says in Proverbs, that the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. 
and wisdom. And here, as you look at that in 16, what does it say? It says, we are to give out the gospel uh, in wisdom and teaching. It's interesting that when you think about it, that teaching takes study, teaching takes uh, looking things over, knowing, knowing the subject some, to be able to put it forth. And so when you look at that, and then, you know, the wisdom to put it together. That's the help of the Holy Spirit in us. Mm -hmm. It gives us the wisdom to present it and to tell it, and to do it in such a way that our teaching is correct. And you know, when the Holy Spirit is in any of us to do any kind of teaching or witnessing, and he's dealing our hearts, you know he's dealing with the ones on the other end? Did you know that? Yes. Yeah, the Holy Spirit on a, on a Sunday morning in the church service when Jerome preaches, there's someone there that's not sick. The Holy Spirit's dealing with him different than he's dealing with some of us others that know that we're saved and we need growth. We need to continue to grow in the Lord. And I've told you that there were times when I would have people come to me at the end of the service and say, you know, the Lord convicted me today of this certain sin that I'm doing and this certain thing that's not right in my life. And I got thinking back. I never said a word about that. I didn't say a word about that. Whether it was a, a habit or whether it was a sin or whatever it was, they were telling me, uh, the Lord really spoke to me today. Who was speaking to him? Holy Spirit was speaking to him. That's the great asset that Jerome has. Is, and preachers have that preach the gospel. Is not only is the Spirit working in their hearts and in their minds, he is working in that congregation. Yes. Amen. Amen. Or otherwise, it would be no different than any other lecture. That's right. Mm -hmm. You think about it. In real essence, you think about it. If it wasn't for the Spirit through Jerome and in us, it'd be like a lecture in college. Yeah. We go out and remember about 15% of it. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. That's why I like to do this, that people can see with their eyes some of the things and, uh, and grasp it, uh, what we're talking about. But I, th I just think that I have preached years and years without having a, a, a lit up sign behind me with all the stuff on it. Mm -hmm. Now I know when I did Daniel and Revelation that that really was impactful. Because yeah. you could see stuff and you yes. could see the things that uh, that we had. You could picture it. Yes. It wasn't real different than if I just got up and kind of lectured you about the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. But when Jerome opens the Holy Scriptures or I do, or Jim, or any of you teachers, or any other preacher that preaches the gospel, or any missionary that does, the Holy Spirit working in us, yes. putting out what he wants us to put out. I've had times where I've put down, I always preach mostly from an outline. Uh, I do sometimes have things that I have for this series, had more printed out stuff. But uh, preach just from an outline and we'll mark down uh, some illustration I want to give. Mm -hmm. uh, illustrations help us put windows into sermons. <coughs> Often they help us to understand when it's a hard subject or it's something that we don't quite get. I can know times when I had illustrations in my sermon that I didn't use and others I used that I never studied. Uh -huh. I've had that happen a couple times tonight now. Yeah. 
where the Lord's given me something to say. That's right. That somebody here and somebody out there that's just down there needed to hear. Yes. But the enthronement is that when we get it enthroned in our hearts and life, we need to show it. The wisdom of the gospel, the teaching of the gospel, the living of the gospel, it's real. The enthronement, I really believe it. See, the gospel enters into us, and that's the beginning. That's the beginning. But as we grow, we continue to enthrone the word of God in our hearts and lives yes. and find wisdom. We have a lot of good people in this church that can teach and can do things. And if they use the wisdom of God and allow the Spirit to use them, they'll be much more than they were on their own. And so uh, teaching and, and the ministry uh, is part, I think, and we do it in wisdom. And then finally, the gospel of Christ and its emancipation in our lives. And that emancipation shows forth that uh, we begin to admonish one another. Admonishment there means to encourage, means to build up. Sometimes we think of admonishment as scolding. It could be. But I, usually it's informative to give knowledge, to give something to admonish or encourage somebody. And notice what it says in Psalms. Of course, those, those are the poetry of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The poetry of the Old Testament. That was their songs. That was their songs and their music and their poetry. It says that we admonish people in the Psalms and the sounds are a wonderful place sometimes when our hearts are broken, when things are just not going. And I always tell everybody, I haven't done it yet this year, you need to read Proverbs at least once a year. Pick out a month with, it, with 30 days, so don't use February. And make it a, 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 an object to read one, chap one chapter every day. Do you know that book is as up to date as if it was written in the newspaper last night? Absolutely. Yes. It has knowledge and wisdom that you and I still need to hear. And so it talks about admonishing one another in Psalms, hymns. I always think of hymns as great songs with theological emphasis in them where they're written that uh, it's, it's showing us God more clearly. I always think of hymns as showing us God. Kind of points to God, the hymn. I think that's why there's so many different words here. In Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, I think are something that we sing that's an encouragement to us. Now, some of the things that are sung today in some churches, I'm not sure what they are. <laughs> where you, you know, it's kind of like some of the songs where, you know, it really wasn't hard to get the lyrics when they only have 10 words that they say over and over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I'll, I think if we look at that, spiritual songs and uh, strengthening us and and uh, encouraging us and uh, it winds up there that emancipation in our lives uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to sing and to rejoice in the Lord uh, sometimes I kind of do, do my do a devotion and I love to go outside and do this or sometimes when I was alone in the steam room you know to sing one of the old gospel hymns you know, there's something about a bathroom where your voice sounds really great. <laughs> or a steam room. 
Uh, I have to tell you a story about a, about a, a doxy I had, I had a, she was the picture doxy on the doxy calendar, a, a document, and uh, in one of those black and brown long old buggers, and uh, I was singing in the, in the show, Ship Ahoy, Ship Ahoy, Ship Ahoy, and I hear, And I really thought, I really thought it was my wife. <laughs> I was going to come up and say, what well, the end of the world? <laughs> but, it, but it was my, my little doctor. <laughs> and you know, every time I did, when we got to that chorus of, ship a heart, she'd go, <laughs> And I don't know what that was about that. I mean, I could sing all kinds of other songs. But she got in the spirit when I did that one. <laughs> but we can sing uh, with joy in our hearts. And then it says, with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It, it should end up with grace in our hearts to the Lord. That grace is unmerited favor that we have with the Lord. Yes. Undeserved favor, unearned favor. Singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Even even if your doxy joins in with you. <laughs> and so some days I just sang it to get joy to hear her. <laughs> My friends, the gospel is powerful. Amen. The gospel is powerful. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask you, bless it. We thank you for Midway Baptist and the folks who love to hear the word. Lord, help us to go out and to show the word in our lives, in our lips, and let Christ be seen in all we do. We ask in his name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>